Hey, little Mia. Hey, Gary, how are you? I'm very well, my friend. Here we are again on Friday, our only tether to reality. It really is. And uh, and then we have a whole nother week to go until we come back. You know, I got to say that uh, when this started, uh, what are we, 13 or 14 weeks into this? That's right. Um, there, um, is that Mickey? That was a Mickey sample from 40 years ago. I thought so. Um, uh, when we started this, I knew it was going to be fun, and it seems like it's getting more fun every time. And uh, that's, I don't know what, I don't know what that is. It's, uh, I think we know that a lot of people are showing up, and I hear, I know you hear from people, I hear from people, you, you know, I'm sure on the Tales from the Golden Road, and I get texts and emails and people have really turned this into their thing on Fridays and then tomorrow night with the dead and company thing as they do and Bob's thing. And I mean, it's the best we can do. Right. And it's a pretty good kind of thing. It's pretty good. It makes the community very happy. It makes us very happy to participate in it, to talk to these wonderful musicians and friends of ours and part of our extended grateful dead family every week. And uh, I couldn't be happier about it. And of course we are also here raising money for a very, very good cause, a newly established cause in response to this recent unprecedented situation, crisis, whatever you want to call it. It almost feels like the way of life we're living right now. We hope we'll come out of the other end of it in not too long a time, but for now it is the reality. Of course, I'm talking about the coronavirus pandemic and the way it has affected all of us personally, the way it has affected people's health, and specifically the way it has affected people who work in the music industry and the fans who go to the venue. So for the second week in a row, we are supporting NIVA, N-I-V-A, the National Independent Venues Association. If you're watching this, uh, there's a pretty good chance that you have probably recently, not recently, but in the last year or two, gone to a venue that's part of this. Uh, and there's so many in our world. There's Terrapin Crossroads in Sweetwater. And there is the Troubadour. There's the Capitol Theater. There's Brooklyn Bowl. There's so many places that are so near and dear to us that are independent and they need help. So what Neva is doing is it's raising money. It's going to lobby Congress um, in the hopes that we can get some relief to keep these places afloat until people can get back to live music uh, because they do need help for sure. And, and a lot of our friends work at these venues. They're not corporations. These are good people. The owners are good people. Um, so we did it last week when John Mayer was on and uh, we did very well with the donation. So uh, on the YouTube button, there's uh, over here, probably there's a button. Uh, please donate if you can. And if it's a dollar or five dollars or twenty dollars, whatever it is, but even even two or five dollars, if everybody watching can put that in, it adds up to a huge amount of money and it really is helpful. You'll see that this organization organization is getting rolling. Uh, there's been letters sent to some pretty high ups in the government by signed by Neil Young and Bob Weir and Robert Plant and John Mayer and on and on hundreds of people. So please, um, if you can donate, uh, if you can't, we understand it's tough crimes, but if you yeah. can, it would really be helpful. Yeah. And also uh, below the screen on YouTube. You will also find a link directly to Neva. And one of the things they are helping people do is write letters to their congressperson and their senator and try to get action on this. And also you can support your local venue any way you want because venues are doing fundraisers through GoFundMe and Kickstarter and things like that just to pay their staffs off. And, and everyone who works at this, these places are like family. You know, they, they are a family to us and they're very much family to each other. I worked in the live music business for a very long time and I cherish those relationships. I value and respect the people who work those shows as much as I've ever respected anyone in my life. So this is a real pet cause for both of us, as you can see, and I'm sure for a lot of you as well. So we're excited about that. We're excited about having a great vintage Grateful Dead show to watch tonight. Vintage 30 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, last week, I guess, on July 8th, 1990 at the Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh. The dead up until then, uh, the previous couple of years of 87, oh, the previous uh, three years, had been playing Pittsburgh Civic Arena. And by 89, they had grown out the Pittsburgh Civic Arena and ended up doing the one show uh, in 1990 at Three River Stadium, an excellent show, Crosby, Stills and Nash opened. Uh, some big highlights. The first set is extremely solid. The second set, wonderful estimated Terrapin Station, a beautiful Black Peter. And Jerry Jerry gives a little bit extra in this Black Peter. You'll hear him kind of tweak a little verse um, 
that uh, is pretty cool. But it's a really great show from Brent Midland's final uh, tour with the Grateful Dead. And boy, is this a really, really good show. And the next thing we're excited about is our guest today. Uh, one of my favorite people, yeah. one of my favorite musicians playing in any genre, in any context, but one of my favorite musicians who has ever played the Grateful Dead repertoire, I, I have to say. He has brought so much to this music. He has been so much a part of this family for more than 20 years now, going on a quarter of a century since he first hooked up with Rat Dog. And let's not waste any more time. Let's bring in our good friend. Jeff Comenti, one of the best. Hello, everybody. Jeff. Hey, Jeff. How are you guys doing? How are you, Great. man? Dude, I'm doing well. Just hanging in. Yeah. yeah. What have you been doing uh, hanging in? What's what's kind of getting you through the last few months? Well, I'm just going to first make sure my payment got to Gary there for those such nice comments that he gave. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the door, that's the doorbell there. What, 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 was it Venmo? Yeah. <laughs> the doorbell. Okay. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, seriously, it's just, um, it's been a real lesson, you know? I mean, just when this first happened and it was just like, wow, what's, what's going on here? You know, and all of a sudden here we are, you know, four months later and we're not really in any better shape, unfortunately, you know, but it's just, uh, just trying as for myself, I'm pretty much stay locked down as much as possible. I do some essential grocery shopping or whatever, uh, get out to my golf club a little bit, which is very, very easily just social distance there. Just but great for the fresh air and just, you know, put my clubs on my back and walk is kind of my thing, you know, Right. We actually had a one of our viewer questions was, is Jeff getting out on the links at all? For those who don't know, Jeff, in addition to all I said about his keyboard playing, he may, may be the best golfer in the history of the whole Grateful Dead circle. Uh, I know that when he was with Rat Dog, uh, there were at least a couple of holes in one that I remember from when he was on tour and going out on the links first thing in the morning. So, uh, Well, I'm on number three now, so it's, uh, I'm waiting for number four. So. All right, man. Yeah. So my golf game is awful, but it's uh, it's – you know, more important, like I said, just to get out, clear the head, and, you know, that's what I kind of really dig. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, like all of us, you know, we've been looking at our calendars and thinking, we talked to John Mayer about this last week and thinking, oh, this would have been the weekend we would have been at Jazz Fest together, and this would yeah. have been the weekend this other thing happened, and, you know, uh, and now we would have been a few dates into Dead & Company Tour, our, our get-together with John, last Friday was on what would have been opening night in Boulder. So right. we're, we're all feeling this. We're all feeling the missing each other, missing the right. audience, missing the music. So, and I'm sure that's got to resonate with you because you've had a whole run of fantastic years with this music. Oh, absolutely. And uh, just the, the reality stings, but it's like I said, we, you know, we got to do our part to get through this and uh, it will come back, you know, but I think the, the more unfortunate, you know, the sacrifice, that we can make uh, it'll, and just adhere to the, you know, shelter in place or just at least mask wearing. I mean, just being considerate to the fellow person and then we'll get through this faster, mm -hmm. you know, we'll get back to music faster and, and hopefully like, as you know, these places will survive and hopefully we'll have venues to go back to play. You know, it's just, yeah. a, it's just a reality, you know, bad reality of it. Yeah. That's a very important part of it because, you know, we take these places for granted and we'd like to be able to take them for granted again, as John said last yeah. week. But the fact is we can't. We can't take them for granted. And especially the independently owned ones because they they have to pay rent. A lot of them don't own the buildings they're in. And they are also in danger of getting swallowed up by the bigger companies, which, which tends to crush the diversity of programming, Absolutely. which, you know, some of our, our favorite independent venues are the ones that take the most chances and give the breaks to the up and coming sure. artists. So it's really, it speaks to the development of new talent as well as great places to play for the established talent. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So, and we'll see, I mean, I technically got some stuff still on the schedule for October. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to come to fruition or not, but I mean, everything else is off the table. Um, like I said, just held on to a couple of things and we'll, we'll see what happens, you know, yeah, Gary and I last week were saying that we had we both had tickets for a, a tour in August next month, of course, postponed. And we both those shows have been rescheduled for next August. So that's, you know, the next ticket I have on my docket is August of 2021. Yep. 
that's tough. You know, it's um, yeah, for you as a guy, you know, it, I, I think people watching this, a lot of people know you from Dead and & Company and, and other bands, but you're in everything. You're constantly on the road. You're constantly playing. And this has got to be tough for you. You know, it's uh, Dead & Company was going to run, what, about a month, a little over a month this tour? Yeah. <laughs> stuff right after that with other bands. And uh, I just, I can't imagine. So I hope the October stuff happens for you. Well, we'll see. You know, like I said, if, you know, as long as it's safely done, I mean, is, is it worth, you know, taking the risk? Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. We just, we just don't know yet. It's just, we're just in limbo, you know. Mm -hmm. I hope for the best. You know, it is weird because, like, probably my well, my last big travel was um, in February in, J uh, in Japan with uh, Voodoo Dead. Mm -hmm. And basically got back, did a couple of gigs, uh, went on just a little week-long golf trip with some buddies and during that trip is when all of a sudden everything started shutting down and i was glad to be able to get home and i wasn't that far away i was just down in the palm springs area but it was uh and that's pretty much it i've been home ever since you know and i, I haven't been home for this long of a stretch in over 30 years so it's a little bit of a shell shock because i'm so used to going all the time you know but you know we'll get back there yep but it's been, I mean, it's been very positive for me here. I mean, I got, you know, I'm practicing a lot and was been transcribing a bunch of stuff I wanted to get to that I never really had time to get to before. Um, been learning some new, you know, this Ableton software now so I can have like a, a work pad for myself and just you know, writing stuff and or jotting stuff, you know, musically down and so forth. But it's been, uh, which is all brand new for me here. So it's just, uh, that's, it been a very positive thing. So I'm, I'm definitely keeping busy. And then you got house stuff that happens or house stuff we had to get to, you know, now we have the time to do it. So I mean, just take it day by day and just hope for the best. Like I said. Yeah. If anything, this is sort of tapped into people's creativity and imaginations and gotten them doing things that they've maybe been putting off, mm -hmm. like learning that software. And you know, that may, that may serve you somewhere down the road. Well, yeah. that's what I'm hoping, you know, like I said, and it's just like, you now it's kind of forced in my hand. So it was like, you know, and I could be easily one of those that like when I got off tours or whatever, it's like, I wouldn't even want to look at the piano for a couple of weeks or something, you know, just, and just take a sonic break, you know, but now I'm, I'm, I'm in there every day, you know, even if it's just a few minutes or some many hours, um, you know, so it's, it's been good for that. And you know, I feel, feel good about it. So we'll see what comes up. Excellent. Well, Jeff, we're so happy you could make it here. You know, uh, we've had a bunch of your bandmates on. Well, I know. Well, and I'm sorry. I, was, I tried to make it about a month ago onto the show, and I couldn't make it. But I'm glad to, that you guys are having me, and it's, it's an honor and a thrill to be here. And I, I really miss seeing you guys, and I'm happy to see you here. I wish I could give you big hugs, and and it was at a show, you know, so we yeah. all share that. We have, we have to do elbows. We can't do hugs. Right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, we've got a whole lot of good questions from sure. uh, audience members. Before we get to them, we want to remind people to support Neva. Uh, this will be happening all through our broadcast. And then when we go to the uh, view from the vault video from 1990, you can still donate all through that. So hit that blue donate button. As David said, give what you can. Um, we know it's tough financial times for everything. The one benefit for me I've noticed is I'm spending a lot less money. It's basically mm -hmm. groceries and essential household supplies. I'm not paying to go out and see music, obviously. You know, I'm not doing a lot of traveling. I'm not doing most of the things that cost me money. So when I dig into my pockets, I might have a little bit of extra change that I can give to a good cause. And I can't yeah. think of a better one right now than Neva. Been doing so, yeah. So, so shall we get some questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Um, you know, I, I like to always start with a question. I, I've got a lot of personal curiosity about the Grateful Dead world. So when I have you on, Jeff, it's it's uh, this is my question. So I came in, I, you know, I started seeing uh, Rat Dog 97, 98, uh, just when I was in, in college, um, finishing up grad school. And then 99, I moved to California, got a jo uh, job with the dead. And you guys in 2000 were recording the uh, the Rat Dog album. Mm -hmm. I got to know you pretty well then. And no, I've worked for the last, what, 20, 20 some years. And there's been a lot of big blocks that you've been the one constant. So if you look at the last five years, we've got Dead and Company. And the previous five years, we have further. And then the little blip in the middle, which was Dead and Company, it was also a huge part. And then before that, we had, you know, almost 15 years of Rat Dog, plus all the other stuff you did with those guys. To me, I see things very uh, kind of linear as blocks and things to you. Mm -hmm. 
Do you see it that way, or is is the last? I don't want to say it's a blur, but the last twenty five years that you've been such an integral part of the dead world. Are you seeing it the way I'm kind of describing it as blocks of the further and dead and company, uh, the fairly well there in the middle? Um, rat, rat dog is kind of the massive thing that lasted so long. Um, I'm just wondering how you viewed your 25 years in this thing. Well, it's not quite 25, but getting getting close there. But it's uh, I never really um, didn't look at it as blocks. I just kind of was just going with the flow. You know what I mean? Because we never knew what was going to happen. I mean, I didn't know if I was going to maintain the rat dog gig if they you know like if they're going to kick me out or what? Who knows? You know, it's like, but um. It's just flown so fast. I mean, I I can't believe it, you know. And but just to be a part of the, of the whole stretch, the whole way. I mean, it's, I'm, I've been very very blessed, you know, in, in all my musical life. But I mean, just I always feel like somebody's been looking out for me here, you know. And uh, but I couldn't have ended up in, in in a better family and of everybody involved, including the fans and and, and you know the impact of the, of the world it has and all that stuff. So it's just, it's been just a huge touching thing for me. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for having me and um, supporting. And it means a lot. And, you know, so. Well, you know, Deadheads really appreciate you. Your contributions, of course, musically. But you're widely considered. Everybody who's met you, uh, you're, you're a good guy. And, and there's no denying that. Everybody who's met you is like, man. That's very kind. I mean, I'm just. That's true. I, you know, I, you know. I was brought up well. My parents are grew up in a very loving family. And that's kind of the model I go after. And you want to just treat everybody equally and and be nice to each other. You know, yep. it's so much easier than being angry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The one thing I guess maybe over the 23 plus years is you'll notice my hair has changed color. That, that would be. <laughs> there's, your, there's your timeline because I used to have all black hair and no you know, more. You know, somebody said something about how a touch of gray kind of suits you anyway. So yeah, said that. I think I, I think it definitely applies in your case. Right? <laughs> uh, I, I've got a question here that's sort of along the same lines of your development and evolution. This is an impossible question to project you know, the future or what it would have been like, but maybe we can phrase it a little differently. It's from Scott, and he says, if you'd never met Bob Weir or been turned on to the Dez music, what type of music do you think you would have ended up playing? And I guess that could speak to where you where you were headed before all this happened. What, what well, kind was, of music? I was very much heavy in, in the jazz world. And, that was, and that's the background I came from. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I probably would have still been living in that wor world. I mean, things were happening for me in that too. I was doing quite well for myself. And it was just, uh, but I guess the, the whole thing is like, the way I grew up was I was, um, I was thrown into a pool of basically I was surrounded by always older musicians than myself, but everybody was like a freelance working musician, getting the next gig, no matter what it was, you know, you try to fit in, you, tr you know, and just be able to, you know, to adapt and be able to handle whatever gig came your way. So, I mean, that was like my growing up in, you know, in the, in the world. So I never, like, I was never really in a band per se. So this really like from Rat Dog on is like really the first band bands that I was ever in. So like, um, <clears throat> Then by meeting Bob, I mean, it was just kind of, that was a fluke too, with through Dave Ellis's quartet, jazz quartet that we were in, Dave had gotten the gig, you know, with Rat Dog, and then I basically was half joking, saying like, you know, if you guys need somebody to jam with, let me know, and it was really like, literally two days later, he called back and said they're looking for a keyboard player, and so when I went and met Bob, it was, uh, for, for one, everybody, feel I felt so welcomed by everybody, and I think Bob was enamored with the fact that I didn't even know Grateful Dead song one. So, and he actually was like, kind of, well, don't listen. Like, you know, I want you to, <laughs> to do your thing, you know, and it just kind of started from there. And that was like, and um, so as things went on, obviously, we, you know, the, the path and we started, I started learning some Grateful Dead stuff. We started immersing that into Rat Dog and then it just started expanding, expanding, expanding and so forth. And, and so just being the freelance musician, I took it upon myself to start, I got to start charting the stuff out. And next thing you know, I was like, there was hundreds of tunes going by. I'm going like, Jesus Christ. And like, how do these guys have so many songs? And they're all so diverse and so good and different. And, you know, it was such a wake up call, you know. But I think well, my yeah. tendency for being an improviser was a, a big factor in, in me being around. Yeah, I was hearkening back to what you said a moment ago. You talked about as a jazz player, 
you know, you had to suit yourself to the context. You know, if it was a big bad thing, you had to have that that swing element. If it was if it was free or stuff, so that sort of is custom made for stepping into a situation like yeah. this because you're learning a different musical vocabulary. Absolutely. It may be it may be a Nashville or Bakersfield sound one minute. It might be more funky or blues oriented the next, and so your adaptability was a really great benefit for you, I'd imagine. Well, I've learned so, so much through this whole process, you know, and it's just, I'm still learning. So it's just, and that's the encouraging part, you know, it's never too late and we all just try, you know, so it's really, really, really cool. Very cool. Um, here's a question that came in. We've heard, had a few questions similar to this, but to kind of ball it all together, do you have any plans or maybe even the word is interest in singing lead with dead and company and where this came from is on the weight. Um, just like led used to do, they'd split it into five uh, verses lead vocals and you've taken a lead verse on the weight. So the question is, uh, do you have any plans and I'm adding or interest in singing lead and dead and company? I mean, honestly, I just never, I never thought of myself as a singer. I always used, I always backed up singers. That was like, a, a, you know, a, a, another big part of my background. So mm -hmm. but uh, how the weight came down was literally at, at a sound check before that very show that the weight first happened for me singing the, the crazy chest verse was uh, Bob just basically said, Oh, by the way, you're singing crazy chest verse. And I was like, no, I'm not. He's like, yeah. <laughs> and then John was like, "Oh yeah, you are." You know, so it's just really like that. And I never, I didn't even get a chance to even try it. So the show, it happened in the show. So, and I'm like during the set break or whatever before the show, I'm inside the, the shower room or the locker room listening to it, trying to sing in, in the thing. Just like, I'm like, oh my God, it's like I hope I don't embarrass myself. But I'm, I enjoy the singing, and so who, who knows what happens? It's uh, you know, I wouldn't say I'd be opposed. You know, it just probably would have to be the right range vocally of, of a song for something like that. But we'll, we'll see. I, I am getting pushed. So I'm, like I said, I'm not I'm not opposed at all. We'll just have to see what happens. But Well, that verse was very well received. I, I remember the buzz the next day and everybody, it's just similar to when O'Teal started singing lead on a few songs. And it's really, I think, adding quite a bit. So the you got to there hands <laughs> hear from you guys. So, but it's been a thrill. It was a thrill to do it. And um, so now I've gotten a little more, obviously more comfortable doing that. And I mean, obviously I sing a lot of backgrounds, which is fine, you know, but we'll just have to see. So. Cool. All right. We've had quite a few questions about what I think is obvious to anyone who's been observing Dead and Company is that you and John Mayer have a great chemistry together. You play off each other really brilliantly. And some people wanted to ask about the switching of positions on the stage, which happened, was it at the end of the set 2017 tour? Or I can't remember which, but I want- It may have been 2018. Maybe 2018, yeah, yeah. But you had been opposite the stage from John right. and they moved you closer together. Um, and I think that get, that choice only got made like two gigs before the tour was over. Two gigs before the tour was over, yeah. Yeah, and uh, but it really paid off. Uh, it seems to have that that proximity between you two seems to really bring out something in both of you. Uh, so people want to ask about that. And also this one person asked if you could envision or ha had have even discussed to any extent doing any projects with John outside of Dead and Company. Well, I mean, we've talked about some stuff, you know, and that's again, once again, down the road to see what happens. Um, but just from day one, really with John, I mean, um, we, I think we just had a natural affinity for each other and just a, a connection um, mm -hmm. and respect. And um, I love him dearly and I just love how he his playing and his, and his being, his persona. And, but we, I think we always had it all along the connection. It was just the fact that, he, you know, I was, when I was on the other side, it was kind of a long throw back and forth mm -hmm. of, of feeding each other. You know what I'm saying? And then when, it, when the move happened, now all of a sudden now we're right here and it's just kind of, I think that just, help that that cause along you know so well i've i've been watching a few of the shows it's almost like you two at, at, at when the jams are getting deep or maybe bob's in the middle of, of you it's like you guys have this inside joke going and it's really nice to see it reminds me a lot of the interaction that jerry used to have with brent and sure. the 
we we showed a show a few weeks ago here from 1989 and there's some a, a few shows we've showed from that year and there's some you'll see some tonight jerry and brent just had this uh connection on stage and uh you know jerry connected with everybody he played with with the dead but there was something special about what was happening in that little corner so cool. when you look over i really felt that a lot more and it's it, again it's like this little musical inside joke that's part of the greater whole but it's um it's a lot of fun to watch and right. if you can imagine the uh the ener energy of the chemistry is now closer so it's just i think it's that much it, yeah. it's able to be that much stronger very cool and i mean i i I just can't help but smile when I look at them. You know, what I'm saying it's like you know we, we're both smiling at each other, encouraging each other. But it's also within we're all listening. We're listening to everything that's going on, obviously. So it's not just like the John and Jeff show over here at all. And nothing. We're not purposely trying to. Right. Okay, well now we're gonna let's let's egg each other on. No, this this all just happens organically. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels that way. It feels, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a special feeling to have that. You know, because yeah. I mean. I, to me, it's like I never understood, what, even though some very successful bands, how could people be on stage together that don't like each other personally, you know, mm -hmm. but yet be very successful as a band and can play well together. But for me, it's like I want, I want to feel the love. I want to feel the positive, you know, and all that stuff. And that's what this band, you know, and all the bands, all, all of it through for me it has had, you know, and it was always chemistry was definitely a big part of it uh, from the get go uh, from from Bob, you know, as he personally stated, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I have a a last minute message, uh, a, a little bit of informational augmentation from Matt Bush, who reminds us that you also sang a verse of going down the road feeling bad at Nassau oh, and also got you. a great reception on that. So the weight is not your only lead vocal. So no, uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> thank you, Matt. You know, I'm about 50, so I'm allowed a little bit of a brain slip. Yeah. So, so, yes, we got a couple there. It's um, so, like I said, I'm. Excited for the for the future, and I just can't wait for it to come back. You know, and I know it's going to be big and strong when it does. And you know, can't wait to feel that love again, the, the whole feeling from the audience because it's such a reciprocal uh, of energy that supplied to us and from us back. You know, mm -hmm. nothing like it. Yeah, you know, that 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 frenzy point that um, you know when you guys hit that peak at the end of a first set as the crescendo is coming, and you've got. 20 or 40,000 people's fists in the air that is unmatched. And that is something that I think everybody is extremely eager to get back to, whether it's next year, whenever it is. But um, mm -hmm. you guys achieve that same thing that the Grateful Dead were achieving at their peaks when, you know, the, the, I, I call it, I remember talking with, with John at the beginning of dead and company late 2015. And something I always loved at Grateful Dead shows was the frenzy point. And that's when you guys, the six of you guys, connect on stage at that moment. And it, people in the audience cannot help but fist in the air and just it's that rush. And you guys do it. So uh, I can't wait to get back to that. Well, it's a healthy thing, you know. And then and, and in that, like, I mean, it's unbelievable to where it's like it, it really, I know Bob's described it, described it as this, but it sounds like a train is coming at you. Mm -hmm. when, and it's just a wall of energy and it's, it's a wave. It's just going and it's, it's getting louder and louder and louder. And it's just, it's going through you where it's just like, whoa, you got goosebumps and all that stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing feeling, you know, and it's all, it's nothing, you know, it's not people stomping. I mean, this is just the energy, you know, it's, you know, it, wow. Yeah. It's not typical stadium rock or arena rock no. effects. It, is, it isn't that hit them over the head with it. No. It's really the movement of the audience and the band feels yeah. really organic. And let me just add that this will always be a pretty guitar centric music because of where it came from. But I think some of those peak moments to a greater and greater extent have been coming when you really assert yourself on the keys. Mm -hmm. A couple of moments I'm thinking of Eyes of the World, you very often get a really nice extended stretch where you can blow. And also a place in Cumberland Blues, just you know, between mm -hmm. the between the uh, last chorus and the final, a lot of poor men got the Cumberland Blues, they just let you go. And that's that's a place that never happened in Grateful Dead music before, where, where that was just a straight up killing acoustic piano solo. And that's, yeah. That's a high point of almost any show where Cumberland gets played at this point. Well, that's very kind. I mean, it's all once again all organic when it happens. When they point the finger at me to go, I'm going to go. You know, <laughs> and I'm always going to give 110. percent I don't care if there was 10 people out there, 50,000. You know what I'm saying? So it's just uh, that's that's just my approach to it. So, yeah. well, they 
people appreciate it. You know, people know that you're working hard and loving it too. You also seem really happy up there. Well, how can you not? How can you not have fun? <laughs> totally. Uh, let's see. Here's one. Um, and we get this a lot. Uh, Jeff, first, we we all love you. Um, this is from a Will, a Rick Wolfish. Uh, and can you tell me? who makes dead and company set lists and how is this done whether it's the who or the how you want to answer. i guess maybe the how uh but um the set lists are very well crafted they are um i mean i look at them i don't go to a lot of shows but i look at them after to me they look like works of art and then i hear from people who went to the shows and they were performed like works of art they were performed you know as they should be um so kind of curious about the the process on the set lists well, the, um, you can thank the uh, person that provided the going down the road and uh, right. work information there to start with, <laughs> Matt. Um, thank you, Matt. So thank you for that. No, but I, Matt is definitely, a, you know, the, the crafter of this stuff. And then it, it goes through, it gets put before, you know, before some of the band guys to to pass, to give it approval or not, or mm -hmm. there's version one, version two, maybe version three. Mm -hmm. And even then, during the show, which we think it's going to be solid, then there's the audibles or just a complete, like, someone might tease a tune, okay, we're going to go into that now, and then we'll come back to whatever. I mean, it's just, so and that's that's the other beauty of it, to where it's like, it's it's not set in stone at all time, but but definitely it, Matt is the is the first crafter of uh, the shows. Well, he does a great job. I he mean, does. I think, yeah. He understands, you know, and it's yeah. just, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's very well thought out yeah yeah there, there are several aspects to it including you know not wanting to repeat from night to night so you've got to spread out the tunes over the course of four well, I think you got for that because yeah, uh, yeah. Been side where you're playing like the same songs night after night after night yeah, yeah not, not really my preference you know yeah and and then also there are certain thematic things like you know okay we're playing uh we're playing Dallas. We got to play Deep Ellum Blues because that's sure. what Deep Ellum is. So, so there are little customized things for certain venues. Factors. I think I think one of the deepest shows the Dead and Company ever played was in Sunrise, Florida, shortly after the shootings at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School, and that that set was so profoundly spoke to that moment. But was you know it was it was poignant and was heartbreaking. It was also exhilarating, and it had oh. some of the anger, and it had some of the release and and that that really takes some thought and some some real heart so it really hit home for us too because we got we, you know the, a lot of those kids were at the show and we got to hang with them backstage and talking with them and i mean just talk about strong spirits and just true soldiers i mean like i, I don't think i could have handled it like what, mm -hmm. what they had went through and it was it was just horrible you know but they really were up they were uplifting to us like you know and we're like oh, jesus you know it's like you guys went through this and it's like you know, I'm bowing. Like, you know, that was that was a beautiful night. It really was. Let's see. Oh, I got a question. Um, you know, again, there's a personal curiosity. Um, a few years ago, not too long ago, uh, there was an off Broadway play, mm -hmm. um, a musical, uh, Red Roses, Green Gold, and music supervisor was Jeff Comenti. And um, I just, I would like to know how that came about and what your experience was like um, being a music supervisor, but pretty, it was pretty major. It was a pretty big play, a pretty big musical. Well, I had, I had basically met him in the business associate of, of, of Bernie's and, 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 um, and he told me about it. And then when I finally, I'm just, I'll say her name is Gigi. I'm going to leave it at that. But it's, uh, when I finally met Gigi and it was just, uh, she was looking for, A, was a music director first. Mm -hmm. In which actually I'm the one that kind of turned it into more music supervisor. So because it was like a theater was such a different world for me. Obviously, I, I know how to rehearse a band, and you know, and I'm blah blah blah. But I mean, when now you're dealing with half acting, half music, and it became a different thing. So it was it was best that because uh, and I had them um, bring in um, a music director for it. So so I could really I wanted to sit back, you know, so I can really hear what was going on as an overall rather than mm -hmm. doing like you know. The specific parts and all that stuff so i want to see what was kind of going on with the arrangements and it was just a working process like that because we were changing stuff and say oh you know this needs or this is this is a newer version of the song or this is how it goes because a lot of that stuff was based off your early studio records mm -hmm. um working man's dead in american beauty so obviously stuff has changed over the years so we try to incorporate what's happening more recently and also still keep true to what was happening back then and um but overall it was, it was a really great experience for me um 
it was a lot of work. It was, a, it was a lot of time sitting around just spinning my thumbs because I couldn't do anything because they have to take care of the stage and they got to take care of the lighting and all the steps. Each step is accounted for. I mean, it's, it was a, a, quite a process. And, and even at an off-Broadway level, I can only imagine what Broadway level must be. I mean, it's got to be insane. You know, but it was, it was a solid three months for me um, living in Manhattan at the time, which is you know an experience in itself too, <laughs> being a California boy. But it was, uh, you know... Hopefully, who knows? Maybe that show comes around again. And if I was to do something like that again, who knows that as well? So, so. Uh, there's a question here that I'm reluctant to get into because it just would take up much more time than we have here to thoroughly answer. But how do you think, in terms of tailoring your playing to a given setting, like how is playing in Rat Dog different from playing in Further, from playing in Den Company, in terms of how you serve the context? You know. It, each band had a different a different vibe to it. Each band had different musical personalities to accommodate. And so and that's part of the training. Like I was saying, I came up learning to do that because most of the gigs I was doing, I was go I was walking into, you know, sight unseen, you know, people coming from out of town are gonna have to play, go play Yoshi's, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, boom, here's a stack of charts. We're we're playing the gig in two hours. So never seeing the music. So it was about sight reading and, and adapting to that. So I mean that's like I said, and that all let it fed into how it goes and um, in each band, I mean, it's like there's similar aspects and there's different aspects of how I put myself into it. But overall, it's very it's a similar process. But basically, it's really about focusing, listening. Uh, and I said, being cognizant of what's going on around you and how do you relate to that? And how do you how do you expand the conversation or how do you shut yourself up when it's not time for you to talk, you know, so to speak? Mm -hmm. so these are all these are all parts of it, you know. And so, and, and like I said, you never stop learning. And sometimes, you know, the one really beautiful thing I also learned through the Grateful Dead world, and I think even Phil was the one that said it was just, don't be afraid to make a mistake. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can't tell you how comforting that is because it was always like the worst thing you want to do is make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That would not fly on other such scenarios. Mm -hmm. We're here, like the, the fans, like they love it. You know, if somebody screws up a lyric, you know, or we screw up an arrangement, you know. You're not going to find that anywhere else of forgiveness and just like and, and the willingness to take that ride with you, you know. And great yeah. improvisers are capable of turning this moment's mistake into the next moment's well, opportunity. Well, and that's that's well, the story of the Grateful Dead's well, life in a lot of ways. Like, you know, if you play the wrong note or if you play the wrong phrase, repeat it like you meant and play it like you meant it. Yeah. Right. My, yep. my, Miles Davis used to tell Herbie Hancock that. So, exactly. so yeah. that's where it's all, it, it doesn't change, you know, so. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we want to also call out once again, um, Neva, our uh, charity uh, recipient tonight. Um, we, there's a button over here uh, on your YouTube page. If you're watching this and you're, you're logged into YouTube, if you don't have an account, you should get one and, uh, and then you can donate because they're doing incredible work to help the small venues that so many of us go to shows at. Jeff, when you're not with Dead and Company or, or previously further and things, you're playing a lot of these venues. You know, mm -hmm. you so many different bands, and you know, of the of the seventeen hundred venues on this that are a part of this organization, you probably play half of them. Um, you know, you're always out there, so you know these venues. Um, th these places are very dear to us. So if you can. Uh, if you can donate five dollars or one dollar or ten dollars, whatever it is, uh, please do help because they will be lobbying to hopefully get some funds to help these places stay afloat. They're small, independent businesses that we all love and we all benefit from by going to these shows. Right. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you can chip in a couple bucks. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing the colors of a venue that's been. I was, I was noticing your shirt there, Gary. Incredibly important to me. Also financially challenged right now. Mm -hmm. They've actually been having some of the greatest jazz players in New York come onto their sacred stage every Friday or every Saturday and Sunday and play a set in an empty room. And they're charging like $7 for a stream of it. And it's yeah. incredible. So I urge you to support that, urge you to support Neva. And uh, boy, we are already coming down to the last five minutes of this. It always flies by, yeah. but uh, we, David, you got one more question we can squeeze in maybe? Uh, let's see what we have. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, here's one, um, Steve Kimmock. Um, I really enjoyed Jeff's playing with Steve Kimock and friends. Can Jeff comment on how he got connected with Steve and what he gets musically out of doing Steve Kimock shows that is different from Rat Dog or Dead and Company? Well, first off, um, I was aware of Steve Kimock for, I want to say it would have been like 
maybe like right around the 1990, 91 range or something like that, where I, um, a friend of mine that was a friend of uh, Martin's at the time, but it was all jazz drummer, but he was like, yo, he's, he asked me, you ever hear this band Zero? And I was like, no, no, no clue. And he says, oh, you got to check out this guitar, Steve Kimock, you know? I was like, oh, okay. But never did, and I'm busy working, you know, I used to work seven nights a week and um, didn't check it out until finally it was when I got in Rad Dog and um, I ended up, Meeting Steve for the first time at um at <clears throat> Belmarin, Dave. Where, where mm -hmm. we? <laughs> yeah. And so it was just from that, and it was just a quick little handshake, meet, and hi, how you doing? And hopefully we we'll get to play sometime, and boom. And then uh, until finally he came in and he and he subbed on uh, Rat Dog. It was really the first time hanging and mm -hmm. playing together, and I felt like once again we had a very natural connection. Then, and then fast forward a handful of years later, uh, he called me to play from with his band so and then that just kind of started from there as soon as we, i think as soon as we knew the first couple of notes because he gave me a look i gave him a look where it was just like i got you you know like and but so and i just love i love steve dearly and i love everybody i play with dearly but i'm saying there's you know um we have a very special connection too and he's really he's good for kicking you in the ass <laughs> yeah. and another yeah. guy from our circle who you've developed a great rapport and working relationship with is John Kaplizik and Gold, Golden Gate Wingman, uh, a band. If you folks haven't seen that band, they are a whole different direction. Some covering some of this music, but also mm -hmm. playing a lot of original music. Phenomenal players our dear friend, Jay Lane, of course, and the oh, mind, yeah. the mind blowing Reed Mathis on bass mm -hmm. and John K playing in a way that you might not otherwise hear him. And uh, I mm -hmm. recommend you, you check them out when they get back to playing or check out recordings of them that already exist. Uh, yeah, that's a total go for it band too, for sure. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, the only would decide maybe the first song, maybe the second one in the, uh, each set. And that's about it. And the rest of it. And then a lot of times we just, I mean, we, I'm basically, we don't even know where it's going. So hence the wing men, even mm -hmm. uh, wing men in a lot of ways, but it's, uh, you know, <clears throat> so like I said, everything I'm, been involved with is very special to me and so basically right now there's just basically dead and company came off and wingman were my main three at this point so, so. it's enough to keep you busy <laughs> it's enough. I, gotta try to, I gotta try to you know have some home life too you know it's important you gotta recharge the batteries and stuff you know so. yeah, right you know we have to start winding this down crazily enough um we have a little announcement to make uh that this series shakedown stream uh we've only got a couple of our Friday nights left. Is that correct? Uh, you know, possibly so. I think, yeah, I think we've heard something about that. Uh, I think the schedule we're going to be checking it out. We're definitely going to be doing at least the next couple weeks. And hopefully uh, after that, we're not sure how often it'll be going. It'll keep going. Gary and I are very keen and from talking to a lot of fans uh, and the good folks at Rhino. Um, so yes, we're, I think, beginning to think about winding it down on a weekly basis, um, but at least the next couple of weeks, and we'll have some guests and we'll have some great shows coming up. But um, you, you, know, going, just, you know, as, here, thank you. As you know, as we've been talking with you, Jeff, this is exactly why I think the series needs to keep going. Um, I, my, you know, my personal deadhead curiosity, curiosity about the dead world. I've just come up in my mind with many more questions I want to keep asking you. So we got to have you back. So um, that's what I'm thinking. I felt that way a few times as we've done the series, but now, right now, it's like, I look, we got a minute or two left, and I so I can't ask you them, but we've got a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of really good, um, more questions coming up. So I think we need to have you back. There's a conversation down the road. Yeah, we uh, we want to keep doing this as long as we can, um, and uh, in, in in whatever form it, goes, it takes. It doesn't go unappreciated. So thank you for guys for what you're doing and like making all this happen and just your constant love for the music and passing it along and sharing. It means a lot. And so just kudos and keep it up. Well, Jeff, as was expressed by many of our viewers who sent in comments as well as questions. And as you know, how we feel, you have been such an incredible blessing to this music, to this community. Um, you have really helped transform the music, you know, because a lot of the guys in the band look to you. You are sort of Mr. Song Structure a lot of the time. And and you have a great, incredible, comprehensive knowledge of where things are going. Uh, and you also, uh, because your playing is so assertive and rhythmic and all that, it kind of frees everybody up to play around a little more as well. And then they can let you loose and, and they'll hold down the fort. And that's, that's a great part of the music. And I think you've really 
really enhance that spectacularly in your now 23 years around all this. Yeah, well, it's very kind. Thank you. And it's like we're all we're all here to, there to support each other musically, you know, so it's um, it's not just me, but it's uh, <clears throat> but I, I do appreciate that. And, and, I, and I, I try. So, well, Jeff, you are the perfect fit. And I listen to a lot of this music and I've listened to you play for 23 solid years. Perfect fit with everything I've heard you do with these guys. So thank you for being here and thank you for being here. Um, and, you know, we'll look for 23 more years of you playing this music. Um, so we're going to, at the bottom of your screen, there's a link to, uh, it's another link to go to this other YouTube page on the Dead's page to watch the actual July 8th, 1990 Grateful Dead show from Pittsburgh. Uh, do try to donate if you get a chance um, to Neva. It's very helpful um, to so much of what we care about in the music world. And Jeff, um, thank you. This has been amazing. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate well, everybody involved here. And well, really an honor to be uh, had on had on the show. So it's uh, gonna, once again, let's, let's do it again. I'd be, I'd be happy. All right. Love you, my friend. Everybody enjoy the show. All right. And we'll talk to you soon. You Thanks, safe. guys. Enjoy the show. Okay.